Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Masters of Carpentry. I am your host, Alex. With me are my other hosts. Hi, I'm Noel. Hi, I'm Julia. Today we will be covering a John Carpenter film that Noel will tell you more about. It is called Better Late Than Never. Yeah, which as I mentioned last time, we almost weren't going to do until I managed to find a guy who specialized in selling bootlegs of 1970s TV movies of the week. You reached into the ether and procured it. That's the only way you can find it. It's not on YouTube. It's not streaming anywhere. There's nowhere else to find it but this one guy who had a whole video collection of these things and just started selling digital copies of them. I had to do that once for a movie for a friend's birthday. There was one person who sold that through the message boards of IMDb, and it was a movie called Army Brats, a TV movie from, like, Disney or something, so I had to get it that way on a DVR. Good times. Oh, yeah, there's still some of those 90s Disney TV movies that are hard to find. Mm -hmm. Better Late Than Never was the last of our four TV movies of the week. This one was, again, for NBC, just like Someone's Watching Me and Azuma Beach. The story was written by Robert Stitzel and Robert Johnson. This was Stitzel's first writing credit, and he only has three other films to his name, Brainstorm, Distant Thunder, and Eyes of an Angel. The only one of which I've seen is Brainstorm, which is a really, really great movie about Christopher Walken unlocking the brain. Mm, I'd watch that. And I can find nothing about Robert Johnson. They don't link to the specific Robert Johnson on the IMDb page, and there's like about 47 Robert Johnsons on IMDb, and I couldn't figure out which one was it. <laughs> and the script was written by John Carpenter, and then rewritten by Greg Strangis. Strangis is also the executive producer of the film and was a veteran television producer and writer throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Other shows that he worked on were Eight is Enough, Love American Style, Electro Woman and Dinah Girl, Falcon Crest, the uh, late 80s War of the Worlds series, and the 90s Flipper. <laughs> Amazing. And the director was actor Richard Crenna, who we probably best know people of our generation from the Rambo movies. Yep. But I also really loved him on the early 60s sitcom The Real McCoys. He actually had directed a good handful of television work starting with episodes of The Real McCoys, so this wasn't a debut project for him. He had done a number of TV movies throughout the 70s. Very cool. The only real Carpenter connection I have here is that this is the second of eight times that we'll see Donald Pleasance. <laughs> but as far as I can tell, both him and Carpenter being involved in this is pure coincidence. Looking younger than he does in Halloween, for sure, as well. Yeah, given that he's supposed to be playing older than he is in Halloween. Oh, yes, and we'll discuss that soon enough. Yeah, I actually marked down a few actors who were significantly younger than they appear. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, should I go ahead and dive into the synopsis? Let's do it. All right. Elderly widower Harry Landers is more than a bit bitter when his home is taken and demolished by the government for a highway project, and his daughter's family, instead of taking him in, sticks him in Last Horizons, a senior retirement home run by the firm micromanager Ms. Davis. Despite his instant bristling, Harry is quick to bond with the other residents over their equal feelings of oppression. There's Mr. Scott, the Woodland Mountain Man who longs for his old camping days, seamstress Marjorie Crane who feels her skills are no longer being allowed to flourish, mischievous pickpocket Alki Elam and former boxer Milton Cohen, who'd love to get married but their profiles aren't deemed compatible by the system, Hungarian widow Lavinia Leventhal, who has eyes on Dr. Zoltan Polos, but he's often so locked in philosophical and political arguments with Teddy Roosevelt fanboy Colonel Riddle to notice, and J.D. Ashcroft, a 50-year veteran of the train tracks who sneaks away to his bottles of booze as he longs for the rails. Harry is quick to clash with Miss Davis and her rigid sense of order with assigned meal seatings, trips to amusement parks where they aren't allowed to go on any rides, and a general sense that everyone needs to be coddled and ordered like a child instead of being respected as adults who have lived lives and are still capable of being productive. He seems to be getting through to her, but in his own stubbornness he starts to lash out, stealing his friends away for a day on a hijacked bus, then firing off some drunken guns with J.D. at night, which causes Miss Davis to herself lock up in her ways and push back. Harry ultimately hatches a plan where they'll escape using J.D.'s railway skills to steal a train and make their way to Mr. Scott's beloved hometown of Rainbow. At first reluctant, the others in the group finally agree, and the heist goes off as they ride away on the free road. 
It's not all fun, as they almost collide with another train, the colonel's heart gives out as they narrowly avoid a police blockade, and they're forced to walk the rest of the way when they find the track washed out. But they make it to Rainbow, only to discover it's an abandoned ghost town. The police and Miss Davis are quick to arrive, but nobody's hauled back before having one last drink for the road at the tavern. Return to Last Horizons after a judge lets them all off with probation, they wince at Miss Davis cracking down with a new list of stern rules, until J.D. introduces them to a new resident, a sea captain who knows the whereabouts of an abandoned freighter. So, Alex and Julia, do you recommend this movie? Julia, would you like to go first? First of all, that synopsis was fantastic. Thank you. It was very well written and dictated, and I got to live the movie again. <laughs> I had to skip over the disco dancing scene. I think we should talk about it at length. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I do want to make an animated gif of Donald Pleasant dancing in the disco scene. <laughs> Surprisingly good moves. Yes. Yeah, so anyways, <laughs> Julie, I turn the mic over to you. Um, do I recommend? I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence right now. I think maybe I'm going to decide when the discussion is done because I didn't dislike it, but I didn't love it either. I'm, I'm very confused, kind of like tonally. It was a little hard to get a hold of whether, you know, we were going to do something a little grittier or whether we were going to do something l like lighthearted romp, sort of like a seniors on the loose type situation, or if whether it was going to have, I don't know, more life lessons involved. So I think I'd like to hear what you guys hear first before I make a final decision, if that's okay. Okay, we'll definitely bring it up again at the end. But, you know, on the fence is always a kind of acceptable place to be. It's uncomfortable, but it is, I'll yes. stay there for now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alex. I'm going to join you on the fence. I was going to go not recommend with multiple caveats, as I found it a lot better than Elvis, because there's lots of memorable scenes and a lot of great stuff in there, but it doesn't connect for me because as you say it's a tonal thing where it's sometimes it's slapstick and we have puns and sometimes people are dying and sometimes it's very slapstick and broad and sometimes it's got kind of like that model and mash thing that they had going on where i'm just like are, are we are we sad now but i don't know there's a lot going for it so i'm gonna i'm gonna see how we feel we're gonna talk it out it's gonna be good therapeutic and i i'm kind of with you guys i'm gonna ultimately i don't know actually because, like, the first hour is a very different movie than the last half hour. Mm -hmm. The last half hour just kind of comes out of nowhere, where it's like suddenly they're escaping and stealing a train and going cross-country and breaking through police blockades and you know, almost colliding with another train and there's heart attacks and finding the ghost town and pathos. It's just such a suddenly weird third act. Yeah, it becomes Easy Rider, and then the last five minutes just undoes all of that. It's like the end of an A-Team episode where they're like, here we go again. Yeah, and it's like the first hour is kind of a very family-friendly, acceptable knockoff of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. That's apt. It's like the exact same dynamics are at play. A lot of the same themes are at play, but it's played a lot more lightly. And it's charming in a Zuma Beach way. Mm -hmm. It's charming in a very, this isn't particularly good, but I'm having a fun time watching it type way. Mm-hmm. But then that third act just comes, and it's not even that the third act is badly executed. No, not at all. But it just feels like it comes out of a completely different film. Yeah, like reels got mixed around. Yeah, it just comes out of nowhere. And then, yeah, that there's this odd lesson at the end. Because what I liked about the whole dynamic between, and maybe I think we're kind of starting to take it into open discussion here. Mm -hmm. So I'll just, I'll just introduce this topic. What I kind of liked about the dynamic between Harry and Ms. Davis is that for at least the first hour... He's not played as a flawless good hero. He is an overly stubborn guy who is kind of refusing to even concede that she's trying. Mm -hmm. And so he's actually the one who's gradually making the situation worse and worse. And she is someone who starts out extremely stiff and prickly and refuses to budge. But then you get those nice moments like where she drives out to his house after he runs away and they have the great moment in the car. And some nice moments where they sit down and talk where it's like she starts to open up. And starts to seem to be willing to learn. So it's like she's not the evil antagonist and he's not the pure protagonist. It's more complicated than that. But then suddenly it's like the third act. He suddenly becomes the hero as he takes them off on this journey. They actually succeed in going on the journey. And at the end, she's kind of humiliated and put in her place for being the stickly prickly one. And at the end is very much back to her evil ways as she you know, drops the hammer on the new set of rules. And then it ends with that weird ending scene of, hey, I know a guy who knows an abandoned freighter. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. It starts out Zuma Beach and it becomes the Goonies. Well, I question whether it has to do with the fact that so many people wrote it. 
Because yeah. in the credits that said that John Carpenter was there, but there was like three other guys in there too. Yeah, it started as a story pitch by two guys. And then Carpenter was the one who, who wrote the full script. And then the executive producer did the final, either the final revisions or the final rewrite. I can see elements in here that remind me a lot of Carpenter. And in fact, I actually think the third act is more Carpenter than anything else. Just because that has some great lines in it that just feel like Carpenter. I would say that, yeah, tonally as well. It does feel more like a Carpenter film. Like, I mean, if you think back to some of the great lines in Assault on Precinct 13, which it was actually on TV again this weekend and I watched it again, I still love it. There's that one line where he has, well, that's enough to grow hair on a rock. <laughs> it reminded me a lot of the Harry Morgan line here where he comes into the ghost town. And he goes, meaner than a rattlesnake, prettier than a woman. And the other <laughs> guy goes, you must have known some really other women. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> That feels a bit more like a Carpenter film, because it's a little more out there, a little more avant-garde, all that stuff. But then again, I can't really say the first hour isn't Carpenter-esque either, because then I think of Zuma Beach. Yeah. But, you know, Zuma Beach also kind of had that uneven thing, where it felt like parts were written by one guy and parts were written by another. So I don't really know. It's all over the map. It switches its tone so many times. Is it? Are we still in the 70s, 79? 79, yep. Okay, because it still has that 70s feel. This is the end of us in the 70s. Yeah, it's a bittersweet moment. But yeah, I mean, like, Zuma Beach, though, still had a kind of consistency to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was uneven in terms of storytelling, you know, and while it was kind of silly sometimes and dramatic, the others, it fell within reason of one another. Yeah. And yeah, the peaks and valleys weren't quite as high as this one. Yeah, this one, the third act is just way out there. But then again, I also read that script, Prey, that Carpenter did, that I did the review for. And the middle act of that was like just completely off the map and like so different from the first and third. I mean, Carpenter can do that at times, where he'll just like suddenly spike out in a different direction. So, yeah, I, I don't know what to say is who here. I mm -hmm. wish I could. It's like I can recognize bits of Carpenter, but I'm not like praising it because I'm recognizing bits of Carpenter because it does still have problems. Yeah. Yeah, it's, to me, it seems like someone had an idea, wrote out a story idea, gave it to someone to write a script. They wrote the script and then someone else came along and was like, yeah, we're going to change a few things. <laughs> and it feels like... The whole bit where the senior citizens steal a train and go off in search of this town that turns out to be a ghost, that could be its own movie. Yeah. The third act isn't bad. It's such a different twist. It's like a 70s auteur picture duking it out with an 80s sitcom, basically. Yeah, and then like how you have this kind of recurring line of the last stop. Yes. How the last stop is like this care facility asylum that people will be locked into if they aren't able to maintain themselves. And then when they're on the train, they get to the part where the road is, where the track has been washed away. And it's like, well, I guess it's the last stop. That is a theme throughout the movie. I'm like, this place to begin with is called Last Horizons. It's like, you're going to die here. And this last stop is not as threatening, even though I'm like, do you even have the authority to institutionalize these seniors? Like, you would have to talk to their children. You would have to work something out. Like, ugh. Yeah. It's such a strange threat from this woman. She's such an unusual villain. Well, I think what it is is that they're turned over to the state. Oh, I see. It's just like his home. Yeah, it's like she can say, oh, I make a recommendation and therefore it goes through. She doesn't own this retirement home. Yeah. She's just, you know, organizing the office and making sure the meals go on time. No, no. What they said was she was also a fully certified psychologist, too. Absolutely. Oh, so she like, could yeah, be like they, they're yeah. mentally unfit. Yeah, so she's like, oh, I can recommend it. But yeah. you can't force someone <laughs> who's of sound mind to go into a state penitentiary. Like, it's true. A psychiatric hospital. No, and that's the thing is that she would make it look like they aren't of sound mind. Then she's pure evil. Yeah. <laughs> they could also get a second opinion. <laughs> yeah. And then that's the weird thing, though, is that for the early half of the script, they aren't playing her as pure evil. They are not. They're these two people who have two extremely opposing philosophies. And it seems like around the middle that, okay, this film is going to be about how they actually start to learn from one another and how they're probably going to figure out how to work together to make this a better place for everyone. But it doesn't go that route. Then suddenly no. he's stealing buses and getting drunk and firing guns. I had a strong feeling that when he went back to his house to retrieve his mailbox or maybe just cry, I'm not sure, his demolished house and she came and picked him up and they were having that scene in the car after he drove all crazy. I'm like, is this going to turn into a love story between these two people? I because was hoping. I thought they were French kiss. I was thinking that might be a possibility, too. I was interested. <laughs> the thing is, I could never figure out where this was going. And it's like every time I thought I had it pegged, it would just kind of go off in a completely different direction. They almost bonded multiple times, but it really is the story of a zealot and a control freak <laughs> battling <laughs> yeah. it out with a bunch of lives at stake. <laughs> yeah, and then it just suddenly becomes wild train adventure. <laughs> it's true, where he is legitimately getting people killed. <laughs> yeah, 
on what is probably the worst idea I've ever heard of. It's a fool's errand that ultimately ends up with nothing. Like, there's no conclusion that's satisfying for anyone, and they all laugh it off. And then, yeah, that they give them that moment of almost victory at the end. Of it's like, yes, but I'm still here, and we're going to have a last drink for the road. And she's going crazy and being dragged into the car by the sheriff. It's like, what? Yeah, yeah. your friend's still dead in the woods, guys. Yeah, they just leave his body. There. Yeah, they, I don't think they get his body. <laughs> yeah, they just leave his body there. <laughs> Which sounded like what his worst nightmare was, yeah. no one caring. <laughs> like, you're going to end up dead in a woods Yeah. based on a scheme that went nowhere. <laughs> yeah, a scheme where we steal something. That's on rails. That can literally not <laughs> evade anything. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so it's not that it's a bad movie. It's confusing. Yes, and its plot holes are a little wide. And I can get behind anything except for this and Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't steal a train. They're going to find you. You're literally leaving your tracks behind you. And don't call your element unobtainium. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't do it. That's just bad writing. <laughs> And it was so weird because for like the first half of the movie, I'm like, okay, yeah, no, I see where this is going. It's fun. It's charming. It's pleasant. Mm -hmm. And then as we get into the second half, it's like, wow, Harry's an asshole. Yeah. Yeah, he's not a nice person. He is not. No. He is very hell-bent on getting his way, in the no beginning, matter what the cost. Yeah, in the beginning, I was like, why can't Grandpa live with us? And I was like, yeah, why can't Grandpa live with you? Yeah, well, and then his son-in-law was being an asshole, too. But yeah, yeah. Very... now I know why he can't live with you, because he's a dick. We didn't see their past. There was probably a scene where he, like, had some scheme and got one of the kid's legs broken or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but that's the thing is, what I liked about the movie was that both him and Miss Davies were fully justified in their position. She was fully justified by the way he was behaving and the way that she was treating him, and he was fully justified in rejecting her because of the way she was treating him. It was just this full opposition. But again, the film, it starts out going down the road of dealing with this opposition between them, but then it just sidetracks off into this weird escape movie, and it never fully resolves that opposition that it's set up. I just wanted them to sit down and be like, we are doing this because of assigned seating and there's no salt in our food. <laughs> Also, there was salt on the table. Bad job, set deck. <laughs> that was weird then, how it cut away from these random, like, shots of the overhead speakers where it would just be, like, these really weird things. Like, whoever left the chrome walker with serial number so-and-so, please retrieve it. That they, was a Raimi joke. Yeah. That was like a Sam Raimi joke. They got a lot of footage out of that speaker shot. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. There was a couple uh, cheats in there. A lot of cars pulling in and out for like minutes at a time. <laughs> yeah. Padding that. <laughs> yeah, they used a lot of stock footage too, especially for the near train collision. That was terrible. Terribly edited. Yes, that's for sure. And then the trip to the amusement park, how you don't see a single shot of them on the rides. You just see stock footage of people on the rides. Yeah. And yeah. then you see them. Roller <laughs> come coasters. And leave. Yes, Come to Six Flags. <laughs> <laughs> like, there is no seniors on that Tilt-A-Whirl. Yeah. Why did they really... Like, I don't know a single senior who is begging to get on a roller coaster. <laughs> I mean, maybe a one-off. You know, like, just one time, but a whole day worth of rides? My grandpa just sat on the bench. <laughs> I think the whole point is that they just want it because it's being deprived of them. That's true. It's true. I understand that. They're being told you can't have this, so that's why they want it. Yeah. And that's what I thought. Was this going to be a film about recapturing lost youth? You know, I mean, when he first comes to the place and you see the pickpocket and they're sneaking booze to him, and it's like, is this going to be all about old people basically acting like teenagers in high school and... But no, it doesn't really go that route, even when they're stealing the train. I would watch that. Yeah. Do you know what I think happened? I think this was a prison script, and they changed it. <laughs> it is totally a prison script. The warden is uh, depriving them of their rights, so they uh, organize an escape. It's like classic. This was the original draft of Escape from New York. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Old Snake Plissken. Could you imagine Snake Plissken in a retirement home in that future? Yes, I can, especially if he still had the machine gun and those tight camo pants. <laughs> Let's uh, address the fact that almost all these actors were not that old. Well, no, not most of them were in their 60s, a few in their 70s. But there were a few that were a bit younger, like especially Harry Gould, who plays Harry. He was only 56. Victor Buono was only 41. Wow. Though he only died like three years later of a heart attack. That's sad. Yeah, Victor Buono, short-lived career, but great character actor. Mm. Even Donald Pleasance was in his 60s at the time. Most of the actors actually did keep acting up until like the late 90s, early 2000s. I recognized a couple of them from later works and stuff, and I recognized the MASH guy and everything. Yeah, Harry Morgan, who was yeah. in his 60s, and he actually kept acting up into his 90s. <sighs> nice. And who was Mrs. Davis? Ms. Davis was Tyne Daly. She was a Broadway actress, but she was also on Cagney and Lacey, a kind of detective show in the 80s. Yep. I just wrote down, is that Rhoda? Is it no. Rhoda and Liza Minnelli's love child? 
<laughs> no, that's kind of Because I knew her face so well. <laughs> She's a Broadway actress who, yeah, she does a lot of TV. She pops up and stuff. And were you guys as sexually attracted to her as I was? I or? was. <laughs> I found her very foxy. <laughs> yeah, I was picking up what she was putting down. Yep. <laughs> but no, yeah, I actually started wondering, are they setting up a weird romance between these two? And it, again, it's like every 10 minutes, it seems to shift into a different movie. It's true. There are a whole bunch of scenes that are almost. It's almost a tense scene. Almost a funny scene. Almost yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, that group therapy scene was actually really good. I liked that one. There's a bunch of really good scenes when they bury him. That's a great scene. Oh, um, that little poem he had was lovely. Yeah. yeah. I got to say, one of the weird things about the therapy scene is the guy who is the psychiatrist in that scene is credited on IMDb as rapist. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I was looking at the credits. I'm like, when was there someone who did that in this movie? And then I realized it's because it's supposed to be therapist. Oh, that so is... So someone uh, at IMDb needs to correct that. Yeah, that's quite the typo. <laughs> that's a typo you don't want. No, it's true. <laughs> and that's William Bogart, who was on the Chappelle show for a while, too. He was on the Chappelle show? Amazing. Do you remember where it was the blind black white supremacist? I sure do, yeah. He was the news anchor who was doing that. Oh, okay, amazing. So in that therapy scene, I think I might have missed something, but did the colonel try and kill himself? Was that a cutout scene? I think that might be one of those John Carpenter things of, like, yeah, I'm not going to show you this. I'm just going to, like, mention it in some throwaway dialogue. But yeah, where he's talking about how he was depressed until Harry made him a part of the group and gave him purpose again. But yeah, it's like, wait, why didn't we see that? Yeah, and why didn't we kill him off without giving him some sort of triumphant arc? Like, at least some sort of closure. Well, he did help decouple the train car. It's true, but he was part of a group effort, and they kind of just left him in the woods. Uh. Well, but I think there was kind of a point to that. It was just a random death. Yeah, that's true. It was a sad, random death of an old man. I just assumed it was going to be that incredibly old woman who kept yeah. leaving her cane everywhere. But that would have been the obvious route. That's true. Yeah. So I give him points for that, but still, it's weird. Though I do love that he got to finally go to the shooting range at the carnival. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I love his line, I want a tiger and a little green monkey and a troll. <laughs> there was a Snuffleupagus as well. I saw him. Yep. You Someone did. won a Snuffy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, can you imagine if Dr. Loomis in the Halloween films was played like the carnival? <laughs> I would love it. <laughs> that would be so funny. Hey, kids, come on. <laughs> he was really funny and just so lively in this role. Oh, Donald Pleasance is always great. The entire cast was really nice. I did enjoy the cast. It was great seeing all these old character actors. Yeah, some of them were kind of terrible, but mostly like the really old ones. Yeah, I mean, Pickpocket Lady was not particularly good, but she had that great moment where she had to climb out the window. Yeah, that was funny. And was like swinging on the net, like in front of the band. Broad physical comedy, then sadness. Welcome <laughs> to the movie. Yeah, and you know, that's not unfitting, but it's like, what this felt like was someone just sat down really quick and wrote a script. Yeah, I think there was talent involved, but not a lot of interest in what they were doing. That's why I think this kind of was all over the place. Yeah, it doesn't feel like polished and structured, which is weird given like four people worked on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like they had something really amazing that someone cut up. Or they had something really terrible that someone punched up. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes a job is a job, though. Sometimes they're just like, fix this. We need this, this, and this to make it through. We need these commercial breaks. Oh, yeah. We need, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, I've mentioned, you know, John Carpenter spent this period writing a lot of stuff, like writing a lot of spec scripts, doing a lot of assignment writing to build funds that he would use for his indie films. I found an interview with him where he's basically just like, my skill was I could write one script per month. And that's mostly because I would just sit around and be lazy for 25 days and then in the last five days of the month write it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that attitude. It was mostly just writing for hire. So, I mean, it's not like this was a fully crafted. I mean, like, Zuma Beach was not a perfectly crafted script either. Yeah, that's true. It was charming, but it yeah. wasn't particularly great. There's nothing wrong with Zuma Beach. Not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's dirty waiting pool was wrong. It's true. I appreciate it. It added depth to his character. <laughs> It added layers to his characters, which we saw floating into the water. Ew. <laughs> Everyone's got to get clean, man. It's true. <laughs> He's not clean at all. <laughs> so, I mean, here's the thing is, we spent a lot of time looking forward to this movie. Yes, we did. I don't regret it. <laughs> Let me ask each of you in a row, and we'll start with you, Julia, because we started with you earlier. Was it what you hoped it would be? No. No. Alex? No, but Julie and I both have this problem where we build things up to crazy levels in our imaginations and nothing ever lives up to that. Uh, I don't know if you could have lived up to the movie that I had in my head. The movie I have in my head is amazing, and I think we might need to write it because... <laughs> Mine was like Cocoon meets Animal House. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> See, and me, this is half what I expected and half not what I expected and not entirely disappointingly so, just surprising. 
I mean, I expected Zuma Beach. I also wanted Zuma Beach, a kind of a lovely kind of like one day in the life of these seniors at this wacky home. The new guy comes, meets people, learns about love and life and laughter, yeah. and we're out. Yeah, like I would have been perfectly happy if it was just a nice little movie about not much in particular. Yeah. See, and that's it. The first hour of this movie is what I expected it to be. Mm -hmm. And then just that half hour just comes so out of nowhere. It's true. Again, it's not that it's bad. I mean, it's like it would be interesting to like sit down and digest it for a little bit longer and maybe come back and revisit it in a while. But I'm still like just sitting here kind of stunned by it just from having freshly watched it of like, wow, you went there? Yeah. How many of you guys thought they were going to go over that cliff? I actually wondered if when they're standing there, I wondered, are they just going to start jumping off? I thought so. Like, this is the last stop. Let's make it the last stop. I thought that's where they were going to go. Yeah, it got really sad there. Yeah, it's true. For like a couple of minutes. And then they're just like, well, guess we better walk. Yeah, there's no real emotional comeuppance. There's like bad things happen, but it never really resonates with anyone. They're just kind of like, yeah. And I had kind of missed the detail that they were heading towards the one guy's hometown. Yeah, um, I missed that, too. I missed that, too. I knew they were heading somewhere because yeah. they kept talking. I thought they were going to go, like, camp it out or, like, build this, like, utopian society somewhere out in the woods or in the desert or something. No, the MASH guy had this whole scene where he was talking about his hometown of Rainbow and uh, about how everyone slowly moved out. and Yeah, and it's like the connections just didn't. He's yeah. like, for sure, we can go live there. I was one of the last people to leave. And I'm sure when they did the whole whiteboard sequence, it came out in dialogue that that's where they were going. It's just I didn't register it. Mm hmm. Uh, probably, yeah. I honestly thought it was going to be are they going to go and try to do this and then spectacularly fail? Yeah. But then everyone will still learn something from it. Like, Miss Davies will learn to just kind of lay up a bit. You know, Harry needs to learn to just kind of let things go and mm -hmm. or not put people's lives in danger just to prove a point. Yeah. I question whether anyone learned anything. No. I know. And that's just it is I thought they were going to go up fail and then just kind of go back and it's like, well, what did we learn today? I thought there'd be like a badass moment where he's like hauled off in the car and he just like grins at her as he leaves or something. It's like yeah. this big fuck you moment. But then no, then they're suddenly on the train and they're about to collide with another train. And then there's like the whole police blockade and Larry Storch has a whole bit with a flare. And like, where did Larry Storch come from? <laughs> <laughs> I can't light this flare. <laughs> I especially love then how they had a callback to it in the scene in the ghost town where he's like, Ben, get your flares. Yeah. <laughs> It was a very silly ending because those cops were like, surround them, get your guns out. Oh, nothing to see here. Let's have a drink with these boys. Throw her in the backseat of the car. <laughs> yeah. I'm still trying to figure out why. <laughs> I mean, again, it's not that it's badly executed. It's just it doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit. I just want to see on the script it say, and cut to shuffleboard after they have this big moment at the end. <laughs> cut to shuffleboard, yeah. <laughs> And then the whole thing of, hey, he has a freighter. I mean, yeah, it's like the last half hour feels like it was written by someone completely different for a completely different movie. Here we go again. Yeah, because yeah. we were on that train and I was like, how much is left in this movie? And Ali was like, there's 10 minutes. And I'm like, I cannot even conceive how we're possibly going to wrap this up in 10 minutes. Well, that's why I thought <sighs> they were going to die. <laughs> It makes sense to think that, yeah. And then, yeah, then you have the death and then it's like, oh, well, let's just bury him in the woods somewhere. Yep. They just covered him with rocks. And he has a dirty marker that kind of says of name. He's, he's got just, a family. He's just alone out there. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's a military hero. Shouldn't he be in, like, the military cemetery? Exactly. You should have, like, a hero's ending. I, oh, I also thought uh, the guns would come back into play. Yeah. Like, I thought he was going to raise one of the guns and then just got shot to death by the police. And then she would, like, lose her ability to control the old folks home. But nope, she's back. Though, you know, also, in terms of the whole, you know, she has the ability to say someone is beyond her control and could be confined to a state institution. When you start firing off guns drunk in the middle of the night, that qualifies for sending you off to a state institution. I'm sorry. He just keeps getting one more chance no matter what he does. Steal a bus. These are felonies. He should be <laughs> imprisoned. Yeah, I know. And that's the thing is he's supposed to be the cool. I mean, that was the whole point of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which was he seems like our hero, but he's actually a really unhinged, dangerous person. Well, I think that's why she's so attracted to him because she wants to fix him, right? Yeah. Because before him, it was the train conductor guy that was like her proudest accomplishment. Mm -hmm. that she's pulled him back from the brink as made him a part of society and through her psychology has worked with him but you know secretly he's off sneaking drinks in a bush mm -hmm. and is horribly sad and the like, carry is her new project that she's going to make break. him conform and break him but it also there's a few scenes where i think she's being really earnest where she's actually yeah. being heartfelt talking about how she wants to help him and mm -hmm. i believe her 
So it's weird that she keeps going hot and cold. And then the end, she's like a, such a cartoonish villain where yeah, it's just like, oh, I'm back in shark cards. Get you. Cobra. <laughs> and as fun and amusing as that ending can be at times, it also robs me of resolving those threads that they set up. There is no resolve. It's just, yeah. you've gone back in time. You've undone everything to a here we go again movement moment. Yeah. And the, um, I thought, you know how they said that she was gone on a break or whatever and she came back yeah. and she's like, here are some new rules. I thought maybe she was going to be more lenient. Like she's like dancing every Thursday yeah. and like that she was going to be, that they would have broken her. Or maybe there would after- be someone else with a controlling interest would step in and be like, well, she can't have this power. That's insane. Yeah. But nope, she's just going to double down twice as hard on this group of seniors. Or even if it was someone new who was worse. Yeah. Yeah. Who was just like, now you have to wear uniforms and you have to be in bed by seven. <laughs> Here's my theory. is I theorized that the third act is primarily Carpenter mm-hmm. and that that is more what the film was supposed to be. But because of production limitations, which we saw with the use of stock footage, which we saw with the very limited use of train footage, that they had to minimize that. That more of the film was supposed to be about the journey, but they just technically couldn't achieve that. So they instead padded out the first act. And that's more the work of the other writer, delving more into the relationships, delving more into the conflict between him and Miss Davis. I think that that's probably why you have two different films. Is then they ended up expanding it so much that it kind of became its own story. That's my theory. That's what it feels like to me, because there's a lot of plotting in that third act that feels carpenterish. Yeah, I would agree with that. The ending... I don't know anything about that much about studio interference, but that has to be studio interference. It can't be anything else. <laughs> if you think about that whole stealing the train and running off thing, if that's the majority of your story, then having that finale for Miss Davis and having her be more of a just general antagonist that they're escaping from makes sense. But mm-hmm. by then having the extended first act where you're now fleshing her out more it starts to feel out of place. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's just bad planning because if you don't have enough money to do your train scene, fine, bump it up. Mm -hmm. Do half an hour to set up your characters, go to your train scene, and then give me another half an hour in the ghost town. Let me follow Miss Davis as she tries to find you. Then we can find out more about her character. Let me see these old people try and make a go of it in a ghost town because that's interesting. (laughs) And that ghost town was a backlot set that was used in Westerns all the time. So it's not like they couldn't have just stayed there. But I'm thinking, though, they went and they expanded the story so much and changed it so much. Just drop the third act and just write a new third act. Here's my idea. Drop everything except for the train and have these seniors just on the run on the train the whole time. Call it last train. No, no, but as we're saying, that's something they didn't have the technical ability to do theoretically. I do it on a soundstage (laughs) with a cardboard train. It's pretty easy to build a train. It's true. And then just leave that (laughs) script hanging in the ether to hopefully be produced someday. Yes. Twilight Zone ending of It's a Ghost Town at the end. Like they're all already dead? That would be good. (laughs) John, should you ever hear this episode, I would be curious to learn if that was in fact the case, because that feels like Carpenter plotting in the third act. Absolutely. Even with the weird random things of we're just going to bury him in the woods and stuff like that, that feels like, you know, Assault on Precinct 13 and Halloween style plotting. Mm -hmm. So they bury him in the woods. They end up going over the cliff and all dying, but they don't know that they're dead. They continue to walk as ghosts to the ghost town where they live as ghosts. And they find the Statue of Liberty. Done. Earth the whole time. (laughs) I might be completely off, and this might have just been how they plotted it from the beginning, and it just wasn't right. No, it's true. It could just be a bad movie. We need to accept that. (laughs) Well, also just a bad idea in general. I mean, I have uh, many other ideas here. Hey, guys, why don't you call your kids and ask if you can go to another old folks' home? Hey guys, oh, why don't you all get an apartment together? Why don't you just get cabs and then pay the money to not say where you are? Don't steal a train. He's such an asshole, though, that I do believe why they would keep him there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, they just want him away, but yeah. maybe you could go to a different retirement home. Though I do love the bit when they steal the bus of how they completely get away with it by the, what do you mean it's stolen? It's right there. That was good. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> and then she can't prove that he was the one who stole it, so she can't really do anything to him. Yeah, you'd have to bust all of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Steal the bus, paint it, change the plates. Go to Mexico. Come on, guys. <laughs> I forgot to mention the worst security guard ever. Oh, yeah. The guy who's sleeping through the train being robbed. And he never wakes up at the all. The one yeah. job he has to do. <laughs> Even as they're crowbarring open the track. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yelling at each other. 
Also, I love the uh, train command center. It was like on the set of the Andromeda Strain. Just... Oh, that was so sweet. I forgot to mention that, too. I like that guy. I'm like, that guy seemed pretty cool. I want to see more of him. Yeah. And then I always loved the whole recurring joke of Harry with the hearing aid. Oh, yeah. That was uh, pretty ballsy, too. And then especially Ms. Davis there at the end. Now she's just yanking it out and fiddling with it herself. Like, you can't keep pulling that trick on me. They could have gone to so many places. I wish that they just slowly lost confidence in this yeah. man and realized that he was leading them nowhere. Yeah. They should have left him in the ghost town alone. Which is probably what he wanted because he was living in that house in the middle of nowhere and yeah. mourning it for so long. Which is what one flew of the cuckoo's nest did, was he eventually goes so far that they're just like, whoa, he yeah. is a little out. It's true. Okay, perfect ending. Mm -hmm. Everyone realizes it's a fool's errand in the ghost town. They leave him. He stays there with his friend, cheersing each other in a ghost town. Just sitting there having a drink at the bar as the police pull up outside. That'd be great. The police came so fast, too. They were on them for minute one. Well, Larry Storch was pretty hyperactive throughout the entire thing, so he was a fast driver. That's true, yeah. <laughs> Everyone was a fast driver. There's the scene where, um, uh, what was his name? Larry Sanders? Is that his name? Well, there's Harry Landers. Harry Landers? Okay, our, anyway. Yeah, so our lead Harry. Yeah. He does some drag racing with her. When she lets him drive her car, that would you would get fired. Again, where they're having a legitimate moment, where she's, yeah. she's yeah. reaching out to him and having a legitimate moment. And he's just like, fuck you. She's totally letting him have the leash and like, yeah. I we can work together and, and I want to help you get this over. rage out. And mm -hmm. he's just like, I'll give you rage because <laughs> I am an asshole. I'm going to get two people killed. <laughs> and that was my big thing was I see genuine growth and progress from her and he's just pissing it all over it. And it's like, as the film goes on, I'm liking him less and less. He's regressing. <laughs> so that I like it even less when they make the entire final act a hero story for him. I liked her more and more, except for the fact that they would immediately make her switch off where she became Cobra Commander. And then they character assassinated her, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Where she literally says, I will get you at one point. <laughs> yeah, they, they Wicked Witch to the West of her. It's a frustrating movie. I, it is. I fully agree with that, but I still... It's such a weird movie. <laughs> It's totally under all of our skin. Like, it's hmm. bugging all of us, and we're all trying to figure out ways we can fix it. <laughs> I'll be honest, though. We're going to have other Carpenter films like that. It's true. Where it seems to be leading off in one direction, then suddenly it just spikes off into another. It's like, yeah, you have all these possible places you could go. That's the one you choose? They could have also made it when they went to this ghost town, because there's so many Western references throughout, where it actually becomes a Western shootout yeah. at the end. That would have also been interesting. I can think off the top of my head... Four other Carpenter films coming up that have third acts that do that. Yeah. You're not selling it at all. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And you know, that's gonna be one of the frustrating things coming up. We got a long way to go to get to the asylum. How many movies are Or the ward, it? sorry. The asylum. Oh no, don't tell me John Carpenter's directing the film studio. He is indeed. He went off the rails. <laughs> See the thing is, I'm still hesitant to call this a bad movie though. It's an uneven, mediocre movie. I think it's just wasted potential. Yeah. The third act doesn't have the potential set up to make it work, and the first Hower doesn't have the potential climax to justify it. I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. I agree. It's just so weird. <laughs> it is a very weird film. If I was back in 1979 watching television this game on, I'd be like, what is this about? Well, number one, you'd be drunk. That's true. So there's that. Yeah, that's a given. <laughs> <laughs> well, how's about this? Since we're all still hanging on the fence, let me just ask these two questions, and we'll start with you, Julia. Okay. Do you regret having watched it? No. Would you watch it again? Ooh. I... Mm. On a scale of one to Zuma Beach. <laughs> I don't think I would. Okay. I think if it was more accessible to the point where it could be something I could catch on TV or something on Netflix or something like mm. that, then maybe... Because there was so many good gems in there. There was mm. so many great scenes. And even just Miss Davis alone was acting the shit out of this mm -hmm. thing. Her little quirk with her necklace when she was really irritated. Mm -hmm. I just really liked her, even though she wasn't a good person. No. She was just on point. I missed a lot of smaller stuff, a lot of background action and stuff that was going on with a lot of the group stuff and uh, the smaller characters that I, I wouldn't mind watching again because I think everyone did a good job. Like the doctor, I thought he was a psychologist. I didn't even know he's a medical doctor. <laughs> and so, like, little things like that. But, I mean... I don't know. To do the whole movie again? Maybe I'll just watch the first hour and mm -hmm. then cut it when they go and steal the train. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just watch the train scene. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. We'll do it in shifts. <laughs> yeah. So, Alex, do you regret having watched it? No, not at all. And would you watch it again? No, but I'm also a special case where I'll only rewatch something if it stars Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> 
You know, the, given the aging supporting character actor cast, this was the Expendables of its day. It was absolutely. <laughs> Expendables is a remake of this. <laughs> Just imagine the poster you could make. Absolutely. <laughs> and me, I don't regret having watched it. And I actually probably would watch it again a few years down the road. I am ultimately going to fall on the side of recommending it mildly. It's much better than Elvis. Mm -hmm. At least there's things going on and there's things to watch and things to hold your interest. There are a lot of wonderful, lovely sequences in it. The direction, Richard Crenna's, I haven't really gotten into Richard Crenna's direction. A lot of the crew working on this were sitcom crew. I could see that. It's kind of shot and staged and edited a bit like a sitcom. In fact, the director of photography was the director of photography for the entirety of the 70s show. Wow. Okay, that makes sense. As well as the entirety of the original Mission Impossible. Wow, <laughs> that's some pedigree there. Yeah, that's two sides of the scale. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I love seeing these actors in these parts. I would watch this movie again just for Donald Pleasance and Henry Morgan and Victor Buona, <laughs> who are just wonderful to watch. And even the third act, again, it's just that it's so out of place. Once you kind of get over the fact that it's so out of place and that it's not resolving the things that were set up, it's still a really entertainingly executed third act. Yep, for sure. So I did still enjoy watching. So, I mean, I, I would recommend it. Yeah, I would recommend it. I'm going to recommend it as well, but I am at 51% to 49%. <laughs> if you're going to go look at the early career of John Carpenter, I think you can still get as much from this as you did from Zuma Beach. It's just very different stuff. It's got some more interesting scenes than Zuma Beach, that's for sure. And it certainly goes in a bolder angle in the end. Definitely goes in a bolder <laughs> angle. I did not see that coming. It was it was impressive. <laughs> I mean, it's a frustrating film, but I still went with it with the frustrations. I mean, it's like Eyes of Laura Mars. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating. It doesn't quite work. There's angles that don't follow up on. But I was still kind of pulled into it. I don't regret having watched it. And there's still a lot of really nice stuff that I got from it. It's nowhere near somebody's watching me. <laughs> oh, no, that's still the top of our spectrum right now. <laughs> Everything still has that bar to raise it. It's true. Julia? Well, I think that the general consensus between you guys, and I agree, is that, as Alex said, we're not angry. We're just disappointed. <laughs> yes. I think it's because we saw potential, that mm -hmm. there was so many gems in there, that we are just disappointed that they didn't get shined as much as we want them to. So I'm going to say I would recommend it. Because there was too many good parts of it to say that I don't recommend it. But, no, I'm not going to give a but. Go in with measured expectations. Go in with measured expectations. Take what you can. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the scenes that you enjoy. And then just let it go. Yep. <laughs> Release it. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, I don't know that I would recommend that you need to go through the effort to track it down that I did. <laughs> Despite the fact that, actually, the DVD wasn't any more expensive than buying the overly expensive Warner Archive disc of Zuma Beach. If this is something that becomes available, like someone finally releases it or puts it up for streaming or something like that, yeah, it's worth it just for these great character actors just having fun mm -hmm. and just some really interesting, unusual bits here and there. And again, that third act, I'm actually coming around to admiring the third act more, even though it's so frustrating. I still kind of appreciate that they just took it off in such a wild direction and just ran with it. But again, it doesn't entirely work. No. Go in with measured expectations. But I think it's like a time at a retirement home. You can still find a lot of things to enjoy, but you're ultimately going to die there. It's a lark gone dark. <laughs> it's a lark gone dark, yeah. <laughs> so I think that brings our discussion to a close. Anybody else has any final things they want to bring up? No, I'm looking through my notes. I think I've said my piece. That man should be in jail. The rest of the people should be allowed to have their salt <laughs> and eat it too. We'll be back next month with The Fog. We're getting in... Oh, that's a real movie. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the shit's going to hit the fan now. Literally? Yeah, we're getting into 80s Carpenter. Is there poop? There is genre goodness, <laughs> if that's what you mean by poop. <laughs> is it the fog that turns your body inside out? That is The Simpsons. Oh. I don't know if that's based on something. <laughs> I think that's based on James Herbert's novel, The Fog, which was a completely separate horror story. Ah, uh, I gotcha. So what does this fog do? Uh, there's pirate ghosts. You'll find out. I mean, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> there's seniors on a train. <laughs> there are things in the fog. That go bump in the night. Spooky. Spooky indeed. Well, I should ask then, Alex, have you seen the fog before? Oh, I've seen the fog, yeah. 
My past experiences with video stores back in the early 2000s have already romanticized this period since uh, video stores are going the way of the dodo, but I watched it on a VHS cassette because that's all they had, and yeah, I got it. Uh, Did you just find it? Like you just? I was specifically seeking out Carpenter films. I, I knew of Carpenter, but I didn't really care about directors at the time, and then I watched The Thing on a whim, and I'm like, I need mm-hmm. to see more of this guy's pictures, so I went out searching for The Fog, and uh, did I regret it? Stay tuned. <laughs> and I was already pretty into my Carpenter phase at the time. And I think I saw this Prince of Darkness and They Live. I got all on video like right around the same time. And so watched them a bunch of times. And then, of course, I had to go through it for I Hate Love remakes a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. So people can hear my thoughts on it there. I will wash it again freshly and, and have some new thoughts on it here. And boy, I've got a lot of stuff to go through because I've got a draft of the script. I've got the novelization. This was what was interesting about The Fog was they went and they made the film. Then they're like, well, the film doesn't quite work. So a year later, they came in and shot a whole bunch of new stuff. More fog. And so it was kind of like, remember that Wes Craven film Cursed with the werewolves? Yeah, I sure do. Where, again, they shot the entire film and we're like, yeah, it didn't quite work, and like reshot like half of it. I liked Cursed. <laughs> I did too. Cursed was fun. Yeah. And then there was like that Exorcist, the beginning one. Oh, God. Where it's like they started with like one person made the film, then they brought in another director to redo like 70% of the movie. Yeah, I didn't like the second one so much I didn't even watch the first one. <laughs> yeah, Rennie Harlan. Yeah. I've I've enjoyed some Rennie Harlan back in my I, day. but Yeah, uh, back in yeah. the day. Yeah. Pre uh, Cutthroat Island. <laughs> oh, Cutthroat Island! I forgot about that movie with Gina Davis. Yeah, oh, and I love me some Gina Davis. <laughs> we need to watch that. Mm-hmm. Don't get me started on Gina Davis. Oh my goodness, I love her so much. I don't want to get you started. <laughs> Boy, imagine if, if she had played a Lee in a John Carpenter film. That would have been great. I can't even imagine. <laughs> imagine John Carpenter's Cutthroat Island. <laughs> that would have been a lot better. And with more ghost pirates. Screw $100 million and blowing everything up. We're going to do it cheap and quick on $20 million and you'll love it. We're going to be in the bow of the ship only. <laughs> uh, let's see. How many more do we have? We've got a ways because he has a lot of films in the 80s. Yeah. We have to get up all the way to 2012 or something? 2010? Once we get up to like 95, his career really slowed down and then we only have like three or four more. Okay. But up until 95, there's quite a bit. Well, that's 15 years. Oh, you know what? That's actually something I was going to ask that I forgot to ask was now that we have concluded the 1970s, I just wanted to look back and just say, what was your favorite and least favorite film of John Carpenter in the 1970s? In the 1970s. Now we're talking just any of the films that he's been involved with. Of all the ones we've covered so far. Uh, My least favorite is probably Elvis, I would say. It's tough for favorite. It's uh, competing for three. Somebody's watching me. What are your me. top two? Top two? Oh, my God. I guess it would be Somebody's Watching Me and Assault on Precinct 13, both just edging out Dark Star. Man, my list is exactly the same there. <laughs> Least favorite Elvis. Yeah, Zuma Beach and this would kind of be on the low end. I love Zuma Beach, but it's not a great movie. Mm-hmm. But yeah, my top two would definitely be Someone's Watching Me, which I still think is the best film we've seen so far. It's one of the biggest cinematic shocks of my life. (laughs) It's the high bar that it's going to be curious to see if even like some things like The Thing and stuff like that will meet. Mm -hmm. As much as I've loved them in the past. I mean, remember Halloween was a very reawakening experience. That was the second biggest shock of my life. Re-examining through my wife's eyes. And then Assault on Precinct 13 is just so pure. That went up in my estimation, and I loved it the first time I saw it. And Julia, what would what would your kind of favorites and least favorites be? Well, my favorites are Zuma Beach. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I think Assault on Precinct 13 is number two. Okay. Right. I know that Assault on Precinct 13 is a better movie than Zuma Beach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Stone Cold Dum Dum. But I just like Zuma Beach. It just made me oh, happy. Yeah. <laughs> Movies are... Yeah. I'm surprised. I thought someone's watching me would be up there, too. But yeah, no. It is. It's third. Yeah. It's okay. definitely third. Because Assault on Precinct 13 was the first movie that we watched where I was like, oh, man, I'm actually really excited. Mm-hmm. Like, it made oh, yeah. me really excited to watch more of his movies. And although someone was watching was great, I was still high mm-hmm. from uh, watching Assault and also Zimmer mm-hmm. Beach. That, it's, it's got Lee, too. <laughs> yeah, that I was like, and Lee's uh, in it. Lee. So good. <laughs> but it was like, I had no idea what it was. I had no idea what was going on. It was such a wonderful surprise. So that one edges the other one out. And I can actually agree with that. Like, if I were to see, without having known any of John Carpenter's films, if I had seen someone's watching me for the first time, I would be like, this is a really damn good thriller. Mm-hmm. And I would just kind of leave it there. Whereas Assault on Precinct 13, I'm like, 
who made this? I want to see who made this. It has a big stamp on it. It's it true. Is, it is so pure as John Carpenter gets. I'd just also like to say I still love Halloween. <laughs> just oh, yeah, not as much yeah, as I, I used to. <laughs> yeah. And then my least favorites is Elvis, of course. And I just really didn't like that Bronco Billy thing. That was painful to sit through. Yeah, Bronco Billy. It was a student film. <laughs> well, made think, not to be liked. I think I also just have a hate on for student films. That's true. <laughs> I've had to watch my fair share of student films. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you get like the half hour of Bronco Billy versus the three hours of Elvis. Yeah. That was just insulting. That's true. <laughs> Elvis I'd like was to just, that. wow. <laughs> no. Yeah. Elvis was just such a letdown. It's true. I think we're going to be on like our 87th movie. And uh, we're just gonna be like, well, at least it wasn't Elvis. <laughs> 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 at least it wasn't Elvis, yeah. And then like, yeah, Dark Star was just a really fun, odd, goofy thing. It is fun. It's the kind of movie I would have made, like, if I had that budget. <laughs> but still, there's so much of that that's Dan O'Bannon instead of John Carpenter. Mm-hmm. Which made it for a neat movie, but it's like stands out among the films we watched so far. Yeah, and you can only watch Pinback versus the Alien so many times. <laughs> yeah. Eyes of Laura Mars. Which was all right. Which, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, like a perfect right. middle. Yeah. A perfect film for the middle. A nice three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. nice little 70s thriller. Yeah. Three stars, perfect yeah, that's right. estimation. Yeah. Yeah. A solid three. Solid three stars. <laughs> C plus. And then, yeah, I think that covers all of them so far that we've done on this. And this has been a really fun decade of Carpenter cinema. Absolutely. A very unknown decade. I think it's like yeah. the 70s and 90s I didn't know much about. Yeah, we filled in a lot of neat gaps. And it's just been so much fun talking about it with you guys. Oh, ditto. Yeah, thank you guys so much for inviting me to talk about these movies with you guys, because I obviously don't know anything about them, but it's nice when it's someone's just like, hey, here's all this awesome stuff. You should watch it. Yeah. Yeah. It's always great to hear newcomers coming and love something, too. It's true. And I'm glad you've been enjoying it. I'm, I'm just so blown away by how <laughs> all three of us have been so in sync in terms of where we all fall on these films. I think, like, Eyes of Laura Mars, we had a little bit of disagreement, but that's just because it's a bit of an uneven film. I think because we're following this chronologically, it's more yeah. of a journey. It's like we understand it. It's like, and that's what's been neat about this decade, is seeing the variety. Mm -hmm. I think also it should be noted that we all have great taste. It's true. And are very smart, intelligent, yes. witty. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, all of those things. <laughs> oh, yes. Wonderful people. Yeah. <laughs> we are... Masters of Carpentry. It's true. We are the Masters of Carpentry on ABC. <laughs> and I think that's where we'll end it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Hello. Hello. How is everyone? We are well. How are you? Oh, no, now I'm scared. <laughs> I have a copy of Escape from L.A., guys. Don't That's worry. That's true. <laughs> Do you have the DVD? I have it on VHS. <laughs> oh, but then you're going to see it all in pan and scan instead of that great widescreen carpenter photography. Pan and scan's the best. I want to see everything. <laughs> pan and scan is not the best when we're talking John Carpenter. No. That is the enemy. No, pan and scan's just the greatest for everyone, right? It's true. Come on, guys. I want to see what's happening when over I there. When I watch Titanic, and I want to see also. And over there. I'm just going to start talking about pan and scan the way Dr. Loomis talks about Michael Myers. <laughs> He's the darkness. He's the... <laughs> <laughs> I like to watch all movies like their multiplicity. It's true. Come <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, that was pretty good. It's pretty good. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs>